Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, an arrest in connection with the murder of an Iraqi woman from El Cajon. A note left at the scene misled the community to believe it was a hate crime. The decision to work with uh, Bob was a difficult one that I struggled with for some time. And we'll hear from the strategist who pulled the strings for Bob Filner in the San Diego mayor's race. Plus, on our weekly roundtable, we'll talk about what a Democratic supermajority really means to San Diegans, and we'll find out what's behind San Diego's historic election for minority representation. I'm Peggy Pico with those stories and more just ahead. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. Police have arrested the husband of an Iraqi woman murdered last spring in El Cajon. Qasim Al-Himadi was taken into custody Thursday in what police describe as an act of domestic violence. His 32-year-old wife, Shaima Alawadi, was found badly beaten at her home in March. A note left near her body said, go back to your country, you terrorist. She died in a hospital three days later. The incident shook El Cajon's large Iraqi community with talk of a possible hate crime. Alawadi was planning to divorce her husband and move to Texas. Cajon Police Chief California Jim Redmond says the murder... Members of Navy so SEAL Team 6 and labor and sex trafficking with a judge of has already violence. temporarily blocked and not part a of the measure from going into effect. On Thursday, KPBS November 8th... KPBS reporter Adrian Florido joins us from the News Center with more. So, Adrian, what part did the judge block and why? Well, uh, Dwayne, in, in addition to increasingly, uh, sorry, uh, significantly increasing uh, penalties for human and sex trafficking, um, the proposition also requires registered sex offenders to uh, turn over to law enforcement lists of all their online identities, so screen names, email addresses. The idea is to uh, give law enforcement um, uh, additional tools with which to track uh, sex offenders and their activities online. Um, but the judge in uh, the case, which was filed by the uh, ACLU, said that that, um, that requiring them to do that uh, raises kind of significant constitutional concerns. The ACLU, which sued to prevent this portion of the proposition from going into effect, is arguing that that requirement violates free speech and uh, equal protection rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Yeah, is the ACLU also taking issue with the tougher penalties, or is this just the online reporting requirement? It's just the online reporting requirement. Uh, the, the, they're not taking any issue at all with the, uh, with the additional penalties. Um, really what they're saying is just that requiring uh, sex offenders to turn over their online identities significantly restricts their free speech, and, uh, and they're hoping that this will prevail in court uh, when it's heard in the, in the next couple of months. KPBS reporter Adrian Florido. Members of Navy SEAL Team 6, including one involved in the mission to get Osama bin Laden, have been punished for allegedly giving classified information to the maker of a video game. Segar Magani with the Associated Press has the story. The first person shooting game, Medal of Honor Warfighter, has brought seven members of the secretive Navy SEAL Team 6 into the crosshairs of discipline. The SEALs are alleged to have divulged classified information to Electronic Arts, the maker of the game. Scott Taylor, a former SEAL, says the disclosure would do little to help enemies of the U.S. and likely hurt the SEALs professionally. Well, you know, I don't know if terrorists can, can just, you know, take from a video game uh, tactics or whatever. I, I really don't know if they can do that or not. But it does speak to a bigger issue that just, hey, if you're, if you're not authorized to give out information or speak about the information, and you've signed a waiver to, to not do so, then, then you have to be held accountable. And Each of the seven received a punitive letter of reprimand and a partial forfeiture of pay. Those actions generally hinder a military member's career. SEALs, including some of those involved in the Osama bin Laden raid, have been uncharacteristically prominent in the news this year. The former Navy SEAL Mark Bissonette, who wrote uh, the book No Easy Day about uh, killing Osama bin Laden, was actually also reportedly a consultant for Medal of Honor Warfighter. 
Both active duty and retired SEALs possess highly sensitive information about tactics and techniques. That's why they're obliged to sign non-disclosure agreements, and it's why the Pentagon came down on these elite fighters. Sagar Megani, Associated Press. School boards have been a tried and true stepping stone to higher political office. Even Governor Jerry Brown started his career on the board of the Los Angeles Community College District. And this week, at least three former San Diego school officials were elected to higher office. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert joins us from the News Center with the story. So, Kyla, who are some of the school board alumni elected this week? Well, Bob Filner, San Diego's mayor-elect, was a member of the San Diego Unified School Board, as was Susan Davis, who was re-elected to Congress on Tuesday, and Shirley Weber, who is the assembly member-elect. I spoke with uh, San Diego State political science professor Brian Adams about this, and he was saying that in his research, he's seen many political careers that started on school boards. Yeah, and what seems to make school boards an effective place to actually launch a political career? Adams was saying that these are positions that have little barrier to entry. People don't necessarily expect a school board candidate to have a lot of prior political experience, and they're campaigns that don't take a lot of money to run. So, and then once someone is elected to school board, it's a position in which you can get the kind of experience that you can point to in an election for city council or state legislature, and it's the kind of place where they, you can start to form political alliances and make yourself known to the local political parties and their donors, which are exactly the kinds of connections that you'll need if you do decide to run for higher office. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert. San Diegans elected the first Latino congressman in more than a century this week, and Democrats say they're about to capture a supermajority in both houses of the state legislature. Peggy Pico finds out what this really means in our weekly roundtable. It's been nearly 130 years. More precisely, it was 1883 when the Democrats last held a supermajority in Sacramento. Now, California Democrats say that's about to change. But that's not the only part of Tuesday's election making history. San Diego elected Shirley Weber, an African-American, to the Assembly, and its first Latino, Juan Vargas, to Congress. Here to talk about what's behind these political shifts and what kind of impact they may have is UT San Diego's political editor, Michael Smith and political reporter Chris Catalago. Thank you both for being here today and talking with Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Uh, first question, Michael, for you. What does it mean for Democrats to have this supermajority? Well, what they will have, it looks like, is a two-thirds majority in both houses of the legislature, the Assembly and Senate. And what that basically means, they don't need the Republicans to do anything, uh, to pass taxes, to put certain issues on the ballot, to pass a constitutional amendment. They need a two-thirds vote. And in the past, just a couple Republicans could stop that from happening. And that was usually the dynamic that led to the gridlock over the budget. Now they, in theory, have a free reign. But I think people need to be cautious about that. The governor said, look, we're not going to raise any taxes unless we put them on the ballot. And this notion that the Democratic supermajority would override the governor, I don't think that's going to happen because it's a, they don't have any votes to spare. He will be able to get some votes to go his way. He's gained great power with the uh, passage of Proposition 30. Yes, yeah, so the, the, I heard they're going to proceed with, quote, respect and, and you know, basically in, yeah, a, in a respectful manner. That's what they said. <laughs> Chris, what about... Um, this, explain a little bit about this simple majority versus the supermajority, especially when it comes to the, uh, you know, Proposition 13 and how that changed things. Sure, yeah. The, the simple majority basically allowed the Republicans with one, two, three additional people who, who would not fall in line to block a lot of these things from moving forward in the legislature. Now, um, having a supermajority, they don't need the support of any of these Republicans. And... It's, it's somewhat significant. Um, as Michael noted, they've been able to pick off Republicans here or there to get some deals done. Most recently with the governor's Prop 30, they weren't able to do it, so that, that's a significant point to make. But in the past, they've been able to have some of these Republicans break either their no-tax pledge or, um, and come in line and sort of make a deal with them. So that's, that's sort of a thing to note. This is, this is very significant, but, but there are some sort of things to note here. One other one is there are two state senators who were actually elected to Congress. So it may be several months, it may be some time until they're able to get the, the, the full uh, that, number of members. I believe it's 27 that, that they need. That was my next question, absolutely. They, so we don't have it yet, correct? Right. It's, yeah. That's true. And, and talking about budget 
budget time or close to the summer break uh, is when that they expect to have those seats filled. So it will be a little bit. But they can certainly start planning. Absolutely. They yeah. can plan for that. So, um, Chris, tell us a little bit about the new faces in the state legislature mm -hmm. that are from San Diego, uh, especially about uh, Dr. Shirley Weber. Dr. Weber was uh, president of the school board here, so she's a very familiar face. Um, she's been a mayoral appointee. Uh, she's a professor here at the college. And uh, she's got a very interesting family background, moved to California, I think, at the age of three. She was the uh, daughter of sharecroppers from Hope, Arkansas. Um, and she's been in education for a long time, so I could see that being sort of her issue when she gets up to Sacramento. Um, and uh, now there's obviously new rules in place, so we, we may uh, be getting used to Dr. Shirley Weber for possibly 12 years, I guess, in the assembly. So we'll see. I mean, she, uh, she is somebody, she's the first uh, African-American, um, uh, she south says, of LA, south, south of, of LA, LA right. elected. Um, so there's certainly a lot of history being made in this election. We know President Obama for, the, for winning, a Democrat president uh, winning San Diego County now twice in a row. That hasn't happened since Franklin Roosevelt. So there's a lot of history being made. Right. And so you were speaking about her race. So uh, six, she got 60 percent of the vote. When I spoke, spoke to her on Election Day, she said only 10 percent of her district mm -hmm. is uh, African-American. So this wasn't just based on we need to put some representation. Right, think? and I think that, as Chris pointed out, uh, Shirley Weber has a history in this region. People know of her from her activities throughout the community, certainly on the school board in the past. So uh, sometimes we tend to make a little bit too much of an issue out of the, the, the ethnic aspect and the partisan breakdown, when in a lot of cases uh, other factors are in play. Uh, and she's obviously, uh, voters overwhelmingly agree she's a qualified candidate beyond all those other aspects. Let's talk about an interesting race uh, when it comes to partisan. Uh, District 76 that it was called experimental, I think, as far as the uh, top two mm -hmm. primary system. Michael, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, Chris is a little more oh, familiar. Okay. I might toss it to him. Yeah. yeah, so this is a race with the new top two primary, which largely championed by our own San Diego County's own Steve Peace. Um, and th th those were passed, uh, this, we saw this for the first time in June, where uh, two folks from the same party, either Republicans or Democrats, could advance into the general election, whereas before uh, the two top vote getters from either party. This year we saw Sherry Hodges and Rocky Chavez, who is a, uh, a re moderate. both of them are Republicans. He's a little more moderate. He's supported by more moderate causes. We saw a, a sort of a late $500,000 uh, contribution come in for him from a group that supports moderates. And what he did that I think a lot of people thought was smart, frankly, was he targeted a lot of Democratic voters and a lot of independent voters with his mail, with his uh, radio ads. And uh, Sherry was looking a lot more to appeal to the Republican base. And I think that uh, this is a sort of an example for folks who are in a top two race, obviously depending on the district, that you really do need to reach out to more than uh, more than one party to uh, uh, in a in a interparty election in order to attract enough voters. You need that 50 plus one to win. And ahead, uh, taking it to the the next level, what they're hoping the goal was is that you would get more moderate people elected to the legislature that would be more prone to compromise. Whereas we know they've been very balkanized in a partisan way. We'll see if this happens with Rocky Chavez and a, a few others. It may take a while for for that top two and the redistricting to kind of filter all the way through for a couple elections to see if we get a more moderate legislature. It's still a very polarized place. There's no question about it, two-thirds or, or not. Do you think Rocky won, either one of you, do you think he won because he was more moderate? You had two Republican candidates. You had the extreme. He was more moderate. In Republican areas, are people leaning toward more moderate? I would say one of the things he really had going for him was he was on the Oceanside City Council. Sherry Hodges had been sort of a community activist. She had been on a smaller school board up there. So just like in the case of Dr. Weber, Rocky was, was quite a bit more well-known. He was uh, sort of a, a temporary uh, um, on the State Veterans Committee. He was, he was on there for quite a while. Uh, Camp Pendleton, we know, is in the district. So that was something that worked for him. He had the endorsement of uh, Governor Pete Wilson, who came out and helped him and wrote some letters. So he was sort of, if you want to use the term, an uh, establishment candidate in that district. That was sort of him. So he had a lot of things going for him. I think one other thing also that, that uh, while I said let's not make too much out of the, the ethnic background, 
He is Latino, and we know that the Latino turnout uh, throughout the country and, and region was was really up. I don't know about that specific district, but certainly you would think that it would help him in this particular race Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Certainly national. That was something. Not only were there more Latinos voting, uh, more actually registered. So it was a double whammy on that. Michael, let's get back to the um, supermajority. How are Republicans and conservative groups like the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, uh, for example, kind of responding to this this new normal, you know, at the state legislature. Well, you know, it's sort of like Armageddon has struck to some people. I think uh, it was uh, John Kupal, the, the Howard Jarvis leader, uh, talked about, is this going to turn into a banana republic? We'll have to see. Right now, the, the Democrats are, are talking the right game. They're saying, look, we're going to have restraint. We're going to be respectful of this. We're not just going to open the floodgates to taxes. We just passed a $6 billion a year tax issue on the ballot with Proposition 30. Uh, and the governor, you know, he's going to be concerned about governing and his legacy, not just filtering through a lot of taxes. So he will, I think, keep a, a look at them. One of the things they want to do is he wants to improve the business climate, and they also want to look at a broader tax reform. The California tax system is broken, and, and it, it, that's why we have such swings in revenue up and down, and that will take a lot of doing. And to just start passing taxes is not going to be uh, conducive to getting that done, and also probably won't help the Democrats in, in two years. We've had people you know, in our local de delegation saying, you know, we will be a supermajority for two years if we start passing a lot of taxes. Uh, just for two years just, on that exactly. one. Chris, let me ask you this. What do you think is behind the Democratic surge here in San Diego and in the state? There are several factors here. Obviously, we talked about demographics. Uh, there was uh, some folks from Orange County, actually the Orange County Lincoln Club, who put forward uh, what was for Democrats and labor unions a very unpopular uh, ballot initiative, Proposition 32, which would have banned uh, paycheck deduction from uh, both unions and corporations, but we know it would have severely impacted unions uh, uh, quite a bit more. And uh, that was certainly something that folks on both sides of the aisle, activists on both sides, are saying helped really drive out folks and helped uh, drive up the number of volunteers on the Democratic side. And we saw a combination of both the Labor Council here, Lorena Gonzalez, and the, and the Democratic Party, Jess Durfee, uh, work together sort of on the northern side of the eight, on the southern side of the eight, to get as many uh, people you know, riled up and as many people out to the polls as they could. We know that the election day turnout was uh, was particularly big. I think we're hearing that now from the registrar, right. and and that is the that is the time with with the combination of President Obama on the ballot. Um, you know, a more diverse population, more Democrats in the city. Uh, more Democrats in the county, all those things sort of combined to help them as well as sort of some more moderate candidates. On one, the one, one thing also, just the, the, the being able to register online was a huge, Democrats really took advantage of that statewide and in San Diego yeah, County. Absolutely. So there were a lot of things working for them, but they, they took advantage. They really mobilized. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, restoring the power in New Jersey after a double whammy by two storms, plus Shields and Brooks. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. The San Diego mayor's race was expensive, hard fought, and pretty nasty at times. Campaign strategists are paid to shape the candidates' personas and mold their messages. The Bob Filner and Carl DeMaio campaigns hired some of the best. iNews source reporter Brad Racino takes us behind the scenes for a look at their playbooks. This is a different kind of election story. The kind that takes you behind the stage makeup and negative ads to see what really happened inside the campaigns to become San Diego's next mayor. This is a story about the men behind the men, how they saw the candidates, how they ran the campaigns, and how they have some regrets. Tom Shepard is the man behind Bob Filner's success. He's built a reputation over 30 years in San Diego, and it's earned him the moniker Darth Vader of local politics. Jason Rowe is the man behind Carl DeMaio's narrow loss. Rowe brags about how he's been called the worst person in the world. Let's begin with the winner. I got involved in politics originally. Shepard is known for getting moderate Republicans elected as mayors in San Diego. For the 2012 mayor's race, he actually started out strategizing for Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher in the primary. But when Fletcher, the Republican turned independent, lost out, Filner, surprisingly, came knocking. The decision to work with uh, Bob was a difficult one that I struggled with for some time. 
That decision damaged Shepard's relationship with the Republican Party, and it lost him clients and personal relationships. So why did he do it? I felt, as many San Diegans probably did, that these were not my two choices for mayor uh, going in, but we still had to make a choice. Jason Rowe, DeMaio's campaign consultant, would disagree. You know, Tom Shepard has the benefit of, you know, not having any soul when it comes to ideology. He'll work for anybody that will pay the guy. Rowe's consulting firm, called Revolvis, is national. It represented 20 Republicans this election cycle and got trounced on election day. For Shepard and Rowe, consulting is both business and personal. And Rowe's professional assessment is DeMaio was the right man for the job. You know, we felt Carl had developed, I thought, a really great brand when it came to reform and transparency and all the things that, you know, they're buzzwords in a lot of places, but here they mean something that the average person on the street understands. The two consultants had more in common than they knew. Both had to coach their clients on softening their abrasive personalities. Both said their candidates matured in the process. And both probably set a record for debates, creating some classic moments. Bob, I just hope, uh, come on out. I know you lost the coin toss. And Filner's refusal to come on stage during a debate because he didn't agree with the rules of the coin toss gave DeMaio time for a solo conversation with the audience. All right, thank you, Bob. Is that your opening statement? <laughs> then there were the ads. I'm a congressman and can do whatever I want. Carl DeMaio is too extreme to be trusted. Shepard and Rowe think the other crossed the line in a few instances, and they both have some regrets. Rowe regrets telling DeMaio to hound Nathan Fletcher over an ethics commission investigation, which turned out to have been closed. Then there was the infamous Lily Pond incident, in which Filner's campaign falsely accused DeMaio's partner of criminal activity. Some thought it was a disguised attempt to highlight DeMaio's sexuality. All I could say about that is I think there were, th th there were things said uh, that should not have been said about that, that were not, um, you know, were not vetted and were not based in fact. In the end, Shepard says Filner's biggest challenge is building a team that he trusts. To be effective as mayor, you've got to build a really strong team because it's impossible to micromanage that job. His biggest challenge is building a team that he trusts and that's capable of, uh, um, of executing his vision. Roe doesn't believe that for a second. And this guy's got no plan, and he does not have the temperament to be a chief executive. As for Carl DeMaio, he hasn't said what he plans to do next, and if Roe knows, he isn't sharing. He just gave us one assurance. I don't think we've seen the last of Carl by any stretch of the imagination. That was Brad Racino with iNewsource and the KPBS Investigations Desk. For more details and videos about what went on behind the scenes in the race for mayor, go to our website, kpbs.org. An organization bringing various veterans groups together from around the county honored two dozen vets who continue to serve the community. It was sponsored by the Veterans Museum and Memorial Center this afternoon. Businesses and other organizations nominate their veteran employees for the honor. It started in 1989 to show the value vets bring to the San Diego community. Some volunteer at the museums, Little League Baseball, and on the USS Midway. 24 of them were recognized today, and two were named Veteran of the Year. The Veteran of the Year is uh, Ronald Stark, who works uh, for the mental health systems, and it's uh, Anthony Stewart who's done a lot for the city of Chula Vista, and he's uh, now with, the, uh, I think, the uh, American Legion. So what I try my best to do is, uh, is inspire others to do service above self uh, and work hard in your community and help others out with community service, whether it be for veterans, children, uh, or just community uh, items that make your, your community a better place to live. All the veterans were given awards for their community service, and the two veterans of the year will participate at parades and various patriotic events. A federal investigation into the injury of a killer whale at San Diego SeaWorld supports the park's finding. The USDA says the 11-year-old whale likely lost a chunk of jaw by scraping a metal track between Shamu Stadium. A complaint from people for the ethical treatment of animals alleged the wound was inflicted by other whales. UT San Diego says PETA plans to challenge the federal finding. An East County girl is recovering after stepping into a rattlesnake nest. She was bitten six times in Hamul. The 16-year-old was reportedly visiting her uncle when she went up a hill for better cell phone reception. That's when she looked down and saw an adult rattler and five babies biting her foot. 
She spent several days in intensive care, but plans to return to school next week. A uh, winter storm warning is in effect for the San Diego mountain areas through noon tomorrow. We could see snowfall as low as 4,000 feet at Cuyamaca, uh, Mount Laguna, and Ranchita. National Weather Service predicts up to six inches and even more snow on the higher peaks. Here's a look at the forecast. If you somehow missed Tuesday's big news, San Diego elected a new mayor. And our story on Bob Filner's win over his opponent, Carl DeMaio, received a wide variety of comments. Here are just a few of them. The reality is we have a country divided in half and now a city divided in half with misguided voters who selected people on the basis of names and labels and not the issues wrote worldview. And I'm glad the voters are tired of seeing developers have their way with our city, commented Radio Free. Banshee then added, I'm glad I didn't have to vote in this particular election. Neither choice was tolerable for me. Not opposites at all, just two sides of the same bad coin. You can join in on this conversation or comment on any other stories here on KPBS by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or email us anytime at publicsquare at kpbs.org. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend and Veterans Day.